Greetings fellow dungeon delvers and welcome to Dorans and Dragons, where we work together to come up with Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition builds for your favorite League of Legends champions. Today we're building Trundle, the Troll King. Trundle is an iceborne troll from the frozen domain of the Freljord. He was a great deal wiser than most of his people and was exiled for simply suggesting a smarter strategy to his warband's chieftain. In his exile, Trundle sought out one of the old gods to provide him with a weapon of great power as proof of his right to command the troll warbands. He journeyed for a long time, before discovering a crack in the ice that wound along for ages, ending in a frozen lake with Lysandra, the ice witch, standing among her army of warriors. Lysandra was impressed with Trundle and his iceborne heritage, and gifted him the mighty club Bone Shiver. Trundle agreed to form an alliance with the ice witch's army once he became troll king. Trundle returned to his tribe and was laughed at by the chieftain until he was promptly clubbed over the head with Bone Shiver. Bone Shiver froze the chieftain solid, and Trundle smashed the chieftain to pieces, scattering him to the frozen winds. The warband was his in an instant, the members awed by his strength and power. Trundle is now Troll Judge, Troll Jury, and Execute Troll. Before we get started with the build, go ahead and like the video and hit that subscribe button so you're always notified when we release our builds. We'd like to take a minute and thank one of this month's Doran's Blade patrons, Ogre. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. Ogre chose Trundle to build as part of the rewards for our Blade Tier Plus patrons. Come join us over on Patreon today for just a dollar to get access to our awesome Discord community where we talk League and D&D all day long. Alright, now let's get into it. Here's a quick preview of the build. For race, we're going with Bugbear. Per usual, our stats are going to be determined using the standard array. For our stat priorities, we're going to max Strength and Dump Wisdom. We do have a multi-class requirement of 13 in Strength, Charisma, and Intelligence. Our leveling path is going to be levels 1 through 6 in Fighter, levels 1 through 9 in Paladin, and then 5 levels in Wizard to round out the build. Trundle's passive, King's Tribute, is going to come from Grim Harvest. Our Q, Chomp, is going to come from Primal Savagery. His W, Frozen Domain, comes from Haste. Our E, Pillar of Ice, will be the Erupting Earth spell, and finally we get our ultimate, Subjugate, from Giant's Might and Vampiric Touch. For race, we went with Bugbear. Bugbears start off with a plus 2 strength and a plus 1 to dex and a few strong features. Long Limbed is going to increase our melee attack range by 5 feet on our turn, letting us casually make some lunging strikes. Powerful Build will up our carrying capacity and movable weight by one size. Being Sneaky gives us proficiency in stealth, and Surprise Attack will let us deal an extra 2d6 damage to any surprised creature on the first round of combat. For background, as with most of our Freljordian builds, we went with Outlander. This is going to give you proficiency with Athletics and Survival, as well as the Wanderer feature. This basically gives you an eidetic memory of the geography around you, and lets you easily find food and water for you and your party. For stats, we're going to balance them in a way Riot can't seem to with the Standard Array. Roll if you want to, just keep at least a 13 in Strength, Charisma, and Intelligence for multi-classing purposes. We're opening things up with Strength. Trundle needs to smash heads and smash them well. We'll take Charisma next for Intimidation purposes, though the smashing will probably help with that plenty. After that, we'll take Intelligence, which he was initially exiled for. Constitution is next for some hardiness against the wonderful climate of the Freljord. Dexterity is going to be average, and we'll dump our Wisdom. For equipment, we're going with a Warhammer as Bone Shiver, and a Breastplate for the shoulder armor Trundle wears. We originally went with Great Club, but then saw it's a two-handed weapon, and Trundle holds his in one. Therefore, you could just go regular Club, but only 1d4 damage felt bad too, so we're saying reflavor a Warhammer as Bone Shiver and call it a day. Alrighty, before we get into the class level breakdown, I just want to disclaim this video as one of our tougher builds. On the build stream, we went back and forth multiple times on multiple paths, so if you have a different vision for this, I don't blame you at all, and this build was the consensus of a lot of back and forth with multiple wonderful people who I very much appreciate. It all depends on what you're trying to get out of the build, and honestly, if we didn't need the lifesteal on our alt or the pain in the butt ice pillar, we could have gone full troll smash. But I digress, let's get into it. Alrighty, let's kick this off with some levels in fighter. Fighters have a d10 hit die and give us proficiencies with all armors and weapons and shields as well. We're going to also get some skill proficiency in intimidation and animal handling. For our fighting style, we're going with dueling to give us a flat plus 2 damage to bone shiver as long as you don't swing with two hands. 
Our final level one feature is gonna be Second Win, giving us an on-demand bonus action heal for 1d10 plus our fighter level. Second level fighters get one of the best features in the game, Action Surge. Action Surge is gonna let you take two actions during your turn, giving you the opportunity to really smash some skulls in or cover an insane amount of distance with your frozen domain. Level three fighters choose their martial archetype. The Rune Knight subclass is gonna give us the Giant's Might feature, which he'll be using for the size growth portion of Subjugate. Giant's Might is a bonus action transformation that's gonna bump us up to a large size, giving us advantage on our strength checks and saves, as well as giving us an extra 1d6 of damage once per turn. Rune Knights also gain the Rune Carver feature, which we'll use to carve magical runes into our weapons and armor to give us certain passive benefits, and to occasionally invoke them for more active benefits. The only rune really relevant to Trundle here is the Frost Rune, which will give us advantage on animal handling and intimidation checks passively, and when it's invoked, it'll give us plus two to all strength and constitution checks and saves. If you use your Giant's Might and Frost Rune invocation and still manage to lose a strength save, I would just throw the dice away, skip dice jail, and send it directly into the garbage can. Fourth level fighters gain the first ability score improvement of the build. As always, we're going to break down each of our choices here so you can pick and choose your own path. At Fighter 4, we're going to take the Magic Initiate Druid Feet. This is going to give us the Primal Savagery Cantrip, which will be how we use our Q. It's going to let us sharpen our teeth and reach out and take a bite. If we hit, it'll deal 1d10 acid damage. Remember though, this scales with level, maxing out at 4d10 damage by level 17, which is quite a bit of damage from just our chompers if you ask me. At Fighter 6, we're going to beef up our health pull with the Tough Feet. Basically, take your character level, multiply it by 2, and add it to your maximum hit points. Then add 2 each time you level up. For those of you gifted with math skills, you'll realize this adds up to 40 points by level 20, which isn't something to sneeze at. From Paladin 4 on, we're just bumping up our stats. Here we'll round off our strength and dex with a point each. At Paladin 8, we'll max our strength out with 2 points. And finally, at Wizard 4, we'll bump our constitution with 2 points, giving us a little tankiness. Level 5 fighters gain extra attack. This one's pretty simple. At first, you could only swing Bone Shiver once per attack action, now you can swing it twice. Remember, when you action surge, you can attack again, giving you 4 possible attacks in one turn now. Alrighty, now we're gonna get some vengeance on that turret of a chieftain with some levels in Paladin. Paladins have a d10 hit die and give us no new proficiencies. Divine Sense is going to allow us to focus and attempt to detect any celestial fiend or undead within 60 feet. You'll know which of the three it is, but not its identity. And our final level 1 feature is going to be Lay on Hands, which is a pool of hit points equaling your paladin level times 5, that you can use as an action to heal yourself or others with. Second level paladins learn an additional fighting style. We'll take defense for a free plus 1 to our AC when we're wearing armor. We also pick up our smite slots this level with spellcasting. We won't have any spells specific to the build until a few levels later, so for now we'll cover divine smite, which is what you'll be using them for in the interim. Whenever you land a hit with bone shiver, you can expend a spell slot to deal 2d8 radiant damage plus 1d8 for each slot level. Keep in mind this damage can crit and is one of the strongest scalable damage features in the game. Level 3 Paladins gain Divine Health and choose their Sacred Oath. Divine Health is going to make you immune to disease, so what happens in Vegas will stay in Vegas. Our Sacred Oath is going to be one of vengeance, mainly against the Troll Chieftain who did us dirty. This is going to give us our Channel Divinity choices and some strong Oath spells. Our two Channel Divinity options are Abjure Enemy and Vow of Emnity. Vow of Emnity is the one we want to focus on since this will give our attack rolls advantage on a creature for a minute or until we bonk it down. Our oath spells are good, but we're focused on the ones we get at level 9, which we'll cover in a bit. 6 level paladins get Aura of Protection, giving you a 10 foot aura that grants you and your allies a bonus to their saving throws equal to your charisma mod. This isn't much, but you never know when that plus 2 is going to be the difference between your ADC being a crispy critter or a rambunctious rascal. Level 7 vengeance paladins become relentless avengers. Whenever you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, you get to move up to half of your speed as part of the same reaction. So hopefully you can block their passage after giving them a thwack with Bone Shiver. Ninth level Vengeance Paladins gain the Haste spell, which we're going to be using as our W. This is a concentration spell you'll use to enhance yourself, doubling your movement speed, giving you a plus 2 to your AC, 
advantage on deck saves, and an additional action each turn. Unfortunately, if we use our haste action to attack, we can only swing once, but hey, that's better than nothing. Now, if we haste an action surge, we can charge 60 feet and whack whatever we reach along the way five times. Switching gears now, we need to get some of our life stealing abilities and our pillar with some levels in wizard. Wizards have a d6 hit die and give us no new proficiencies. The only feature we do pick up is arcane recovery, which is just going to let us use a short rest once a day to recharge spell slots equal to half our level. Second level wizards choose their arcane tradition, which is basically what magical school they're going to focus in on. We're going with school of necromancy to gain the grim harvest feature, which we'll use in conjunction with our ultimate to gain our passive. With grim harvest, whenever you kill creatures using spells above first level, you heal back hit points equal to twice that spell's level, or three times when it's a necromancy spell. So, when we use our subjugate with vampiric touch and kill a creature with it, not only do we regain the health from the spell, but Grim Harvest is going to hit us back with between 9 and 15 hit points depending on the level we cast at. And speaking of vampiric touch, level 5 wizards learn third level spells. We'll cover vampiric touch first, which is going to let you reach out and start ripping away your target's health to heal yourself. You'll make a melee spell attack roll and deal 3d6 necrotic damage if it hits, healing yourself for half of the damage dealt. But that's not all. The spell lasts for a minute, and you can continue to use your action to make the attack again and again. And finally, we get our E with Erupting Earth. This is going to let you create a fountain of churned earth and stone in a 20-foot cube, smacking anyone who fails a deck save with 3d12 bludgeoning damage. And just like your pillar, the ground in the area becomes difficult to rain, making everyone move slower through it. Alright, now that we've completed the build, let's see how we did. First the good. We have our troll, and we have our smash. We also have a fair amount of durability, and subjugating your enemies is going to be a lot of fun. Now the bad. The main bad parts are that our club and pillar aren't made of ice, and our pillar doesn't really last as a pillar for long. The other bad part is that I know this is going to be one of our more divisive builds because of all the potential choices I alluded to at the beginning of the build. So what'd you think? I've included a link to this build via D&D Beyond in the description below as well as Amazon links to the book used in the build. If you enjoy this type of content, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We have a few awesome rewards and you get access to our great Discord community. We plan on turning out one League Champion build every week. Thanks for watching and hopefully we'll catch you on the Rift or in the Forgotten Realms.